I guess I'll get started. This is probably about all we should expect this time of day. <clears throat> so in honor of uh, Father's Day, uh, we're going to talk about what isn't your father's digital data. And uh, I'll start by just answering a few introductory questions that are probably going through your mind. Uh, the talk will have that kind of a structure. I'll just talk for about 10 minutes about background on um, work that I've been doing and how that got me thinking about digital data. And then hopefully spend the majority of the time talking about building corporate of digital data, what they're good for, uh, why people should want to build them, how they can improve delivery of uh, technology and of educational content. Um, and then uh, hopefully have a few, few minutes for questions and answers too. Um, some more questions you probably want to know about. Um, who is this guy and how do you come up with this topic and uh, what is this organization he belongs to and why should I care about it? Um, so I'm fairly familiar with the Cali community because in a previous life from 1990 to 1997, to 97, um, I worked at University of Pennsylvania Law School as, as director of computing. Um, and in January of 1998, left to work for an organization called the Linguistic Data Consortium um, by training a linguist actually and um, had been deflected into law computing for unrelated reasons. And noticed that the organization was actually building a fair number of corpora uh, that were related to law and doing it without any discussion with the law community. Not, no discussion with uh, information managers, uh, professors, uh, librarians, just uh, building corpora as it were in a vacuum. And it seemed to me like a bad idea. So uh, one of my goals was to try and connect up the community uh, that is being served by my organization, I'll talk about the community more in a minute, with this community and with communities uh, that are like this in general, interested in, in law computing. Okay. Um, and I'll get, I'll get to what the, uh, my organization is in a minute. So the goals of my presentation are, to, again, as I said, to try and connect up my organization and people who develop language technology, which is now being delivered to help people in pretty much every area, uh, every content area in the world, um, with this organization, with this group right here, uh, including researchers, educators, and information managers who work with legal content. I also am here at Cali because I want to keep in touch with what's going on, um, what databases are being built in law and in related efforts and open discussions uh, perhaps on how my organization can collaborate with people in this community who are building digital databases or who hope to be building digital databases. So let me talk about the organization just briefly. The Linguistic Data Consortium is a nonprofit activity of Penn, the University of Pennsylvania. It's an open consortium. It's, business model is actually a lot like Cali. It's an open consortium of universities, but also includes government agencies and companies. It was founded in 1992, originally with funding from DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration of the U.S. government, uh, and has continuing funding from the National Science Foundation. And the goal was to create databases to support the development of language technology originally. That's now grown and it's also supporting education and uh, sort of basic research having to do with, uh, with language. So the organization collects, prepares, and distributes uh, language data for education, research, clinical practice, and technology development related to language. Um, so before everyone gets up and leaves, let me, let me generalize what, uh, and explain what I think language data is. So language data, as we define it, is um, text, image, audio, and video that contains language. Get it? Um, so it overlaps with most professions, right? That is medicine, um, government, communications, law, all those organizations work with data, unless you're in sort of DNA research, then the data that you work with contains language and then it's interesting to groups who are doing language technology development and also interesting to content, people who are interested in the content of the language. So we actually have corporate that we've produced um, in each of those areas. For example, we're actually working on a corpus right now um, for the medical community in dysarthric speech. So it's collections of people who were interviewed multiple times after having surgery for some kind of brain problem, a lesion or a brain trauma or something like that. And so that data is useful for people who are doing clinical practice in speech pathology. Uh, for the government, we've actually collected corporate or resource management to develop sort of task guided systems. Let's say you um, want to develop a system where you can talk to it and get information about where, the, where Amtrak trains are around the country. So um, 
you want to be able to establish what the vocabulary is of talking about Amtrak trains and how that gets done and, and, and in order to be able to develop a system which then allows you to say call up on the phone and say where's train number 1206. So uh, to do that, develop a technology system, you first have to study the language and the data. And so we collected a corpora for that. Uh, in the field of communications, we've collected a corpus for topic detection and tracking, which um, is supposed to support systems that monitor the news and say, what are the new topics in the news today? Uh, and if one of those topics looks interesting to you, say, okay, find me all stories that discuss that topic, but not just in English, in any language. So the, this, this project is actually um, have, is in a sort of heavy phase of research right now, and this year's goal is to do information retrieval across languages. If I tell you I like a story that I find in the New York Times about uh, the Bosnian, the Serbian pullout of Kosovo, I want you to find all stories like that that are also in Mandarin or that are also in Spanish. Bring those back to me too. Uh, and finally, in law, we have three corpora that I'll talk about a little bit later on called Juris, uh, Hansard, and United Nations Parallel Text Corpus. So I'll, I'll actually show those a little bit later. So the, the point is that language data overlaps with a lot of uh, fields, and that's why I felt like it was a good idea to come talk to this group. So the corpus that we've developed in law, uh, the Hansard corpus contains, not surprisingly, the proceedings of the Canadian uh, Parliament uh, in French and English, and it was collected from the mid-70s through 1988. It contains about 3,300 files, and uh, the compressed version of it is 645 uh, megabytes. I didn't have a chance to uncompress and see how big it was while I was down here. Uh, and that's actually, it supports research in machine translation for legal content, right? So the idea is that if you can hand to a computer system a whole bunch of legal content in English and the same stuff in French and it's parallelized so you know that this paragraph corresponds to this paragraph, the systems can be trained to develop machine translation capability of their own, capability of their own translation. Uh, to sort of mimic the human behavior. The Juris Corpus um, can, it was actually based upon the Department of Justice's um, information retrieval system, also called Juris. And uh, it has about 650,000 docu uh, documents. It's about 960 megabytes compressed. And it covers these areas, administrative law, briefs, case law, and so forth. Essentially what we did was when we learned about the existence of this um, data, which used to be um, cobbled together with a mainframe-based information retrieval system at the Justice Department, we actually sent them a Freedom of Information Act request for the entire contents of Juris, for all everything that was in Juris, which was indisputably in the public domain, and got that much data, and did some SGL, SGML markup of it, and deliver it on, uh, on CD now to organizations who want to build information retrieval systems for law because they wanted to train the system to, you know, how legal language is different, how language in case law is different from in regulatory law. And the third corpus uh, is this UN Parallel Text Corpus, which is also meant to support machine translation for law. And so it's got documents in uh, English, French, and Spanish, spans 1988 to 1993, and it's about uh, two and a half gigabytes of text. Um, just to show you an example, here's a little tiny piece from the UN Parallel Text Corpus. So it's a letter of December of 92 um, on, uh, well, the first paragraph says it's on. The instructions of my government, I wish to inform you of pressure regarding violations of the ceasefire between the two countries during that period. And um, the way this corpus is organized is that each the file numbering shows you the parallelism in the text. So uh, file number 93, etc., etc., dot SPA is the Spanish version of the same file which has this file name. And so forth. These uh, files are parallelized at the level of document. In the Hansard uh, corpus I mentioned earlier, the files are actually parallelized at the level of sentence. So every single sentence is numbered. And if you look at that number, find the corresponding number in the French version, you can see how each and every sentence was translated. Okay. So this is some of the corpus that we've actually uh, produced to support technology development related to law. The model of the organization is to, uh, was originally to distribute data that was created by other organizations. So at one point, we were just a clearinghouse and a publisher. Um, uh, for example, the Hansard was uh, begun by IBM's T.J. Watson lab. They started collecting the Hansard corpus. 
and we published it for them. But over the last three years, it's increasingly um, moved into uh, creating databases in response to community needs. And uh, part of our most recent drive is to reach out to new communities, especially medicine, law, uh, communications, government. Um, the, our model also, uh, our mission is to make our data available to everyone. So any organization can join the, the LDC, can join the consortium, and anyone that does uh, gets a free copy of all the data that's published in that year. Again, it's like Cal's model. And some corporate can be sold. And the last component of our sort of business model is to act as an intermediary for intellectual property. So one of the things we've discovered is that providers of this data, um, to the extent that they're uh, unresponsive to requests for their data, it's often because it's a hassle for them to have to deal with 30 or 40 requests per year for a large transfer of data. So the LDC acts as an intermediary. We make a single request to an organization like the Justice Department to get their data and then distribute it to a number of other organizations. They're happy to make that data available to us because it's, you know, one twentieth of the effort they might otherwise expect. So why does this work? I mean, why does an organization like this exist and, and, and continue? And the reasons are several. One is that, um, Research and development in any of these fields requires very large amounts of data. So to train, for example, an automatic speech recognition system, you have to let listen to thousands of hours of speech and look at the transcripts that go along with it. And if you can do that, the system can actually learn how to transcribe for you. Um, to build corporate on this size and scale, you need specialized equipment and, special, and specially trained staff. You need uh, equipment that the average organization doesn't have. Um, and their effort to create these corporate is relatively large so that the average nonprofit isn't going to want to do it themselves. A large corporation like IBM or AT&T could do it, but they don't see it as, as be cost effective if they can pay somebody else to do it for them and distribute costs across several corporations. And finally, the government doesn't want to do it either. They, they also have the resources to do it, but they see it as wasteful of their money. So that's actually one of the reasons why the government saw fit to establish the LDC. And the last reason is that, and this is something that every person who works in law knows, right? A stable source of reference material allows you to do things like compare um, and evaluate different technology, but also different theory, but also different approaches, right? So, you know, this is crucial to law, the fact that the law has to be codified somewhere and readily available and has needed to be that for thousands of years uh, means that none of you are surprised by the statement that there has to be a stable source of data to be able to understand we're talking about the same thing, to be able to compare um, uh, two different arguments, for example. This is not true in other fields. Actually, in linguistics, people have to be told this. Uh, and in language technology, people had to be told this at least up to, say, the late 80s. Just to give you a sense of what, what I mean by specialized equipment, here's, uh, I won't go through this in too much detail, but um, here's some of the equipment that we have to have in-house in to be able to manage large corporate. Um, we have about a 1.2 terabytes of um, RAID backed up disk because speech data takes up an awful lot of space. Um, and an additional terabyte of nearline storage, those are tapes. The data gets written out to tapes and there's a robot and if you request a file, the robot goes to the tape and gets it and reads it back in again because you really can't afford to have too many terabytes of spinning disk before uh, the budget is unmanageable. Um, and other interesting things like a satellite downlink so that we can record a variety of TV and radio broadcasts that you can't just get on cable. Um, a lot of our collections have to do with things like processing speech data over telephone. So we also have platforms for collecting telephone calls. We have an, a, a switchboard essentially in our office that people can call through it so that we can record the calls and use that data to train speech recognition systems for telephones. Uh, and, and a lot of um, workstations, a lot of AV equipment, that, you know, DAT links and DAT decks and special VCRs and so forth that the average organization doesn't have, closed captioning decoders and things like that. And I also said you, this kind of work requires specially trained staff. This is a just a brief uh, view of the staff at LBC. And the thing I'll point out to you is uh, a very large staff of annotators. These are people whose job is to um, look at data and make some, some kind of visual commentary about it, use some human judgment to categorize data. So one of the things these people do, for example, is look at uh, news stories and categorize it as the topic it describes. Uh, another thing they do is transcribe uh, spoken word, uh, but to a very fine level of detail. So somebody, that, right now as I'm talking, um, if 
one of my staff were transcribing me, they would actually transcribe every disfluency, every um, every throat clearing, every cough, every piece of background noise, because that's what's required to uh, help so uh, software uh, transcribe speech for you. Um, and I said that you had to be specially trained, so if there are any programmers in the room, um, you know, the average programmer needs to know things like C and C++ and Perl and Java, but to build corpora, um, you know, you need to know things like HTML, maybe. Some of my staff have to know ANPA, which is the standard that uh, news wires are encoded in. Um, Sphere is another kind of uh, audio file equivalent to WAVE. Um, and a variety of other things that the average person in MIS doesn't have to know, but which required at the moment for handling digital data. Um, the only street distributes data, as, as I said, our machines distribute data to everyone and make it available to all. This just shows sales. So um, this is the number, the color codes, the colors encode the number of organizations in any one of those countries which purchases data from the LDC. This doesn't show membership, for example. <coughs> our members get our data for free, and so that's not encoded on this graph. And finally, how much data am I talking about here? Uh, so if you look at this graph, it shows starting in 1992 and climbing up how much data is available if you took all the data in our catalog and kind of crammed it together. So the, it, the growth is relatively small from 92 through 96 because we were mostly just publishing data for other organizations. But in 97 and, and thereafter, actually in 96 and thereafter, we began creating our own corpora, actually being asked to create corpora for uh, various organizations. And then the amount grew. So this, uh, right now, if you were to, if you owned everything that the LDC ever published, it would be about 375 gigabytes of data. And that's 514 CDs if you try to have it all together. OK. So let me finish up with my organization and talk a little bit about how um, we actually see corpus building happen. Just to finish up, uh, the LDC has published over 150 corpora and delivered them to over 650 organizations. Um, in those areas, engineering, language, regional studies, medicine, and law, and um, has transacted nearly 10,000 distributions. That means some organization has gotten some corpus of ours. If you add all those transactions up, it's about 10,000 transactions to date. Uh, whoever gets 10,000 is going to get a reward. You decide. Yeah. Um, and the question is this is the question, I think, the crucial question is it time now to start talking about digital data in general terms? Can we stop talking about just a text <coughs> archive or just a big structured database or just my digital library project where I'm imaging, you know, uh, the thousand most popular books? Is it time to start talking about digital data in general, also including things like audio and video and, and so forth? And there's two pieces of evidence that suggest to me that it is. Um, one of them is that we've been asked to act as consultants for the National Gallery of the Spoken Word, which is a project pr uh, proposed by the Vincent Boyce Library at Michigan State University. Uh, Michael Seals, the uh, PI on that. And it has been backed by the NSF. And the goal here is to take the contents, or at least a subset of the contents of the Vincent Boyce Library, uh, which has something like 67,000 hours of famous speeches by presidents, um, inter in community interviews. Uh, there's a Chicago community study with David and lots of people about you know what it's like to live in Chicago. Uh, to take the data of the Vincent Boyce Library and put uh, a very sizable chunk of it on the web um, for for access. And we've been asked to be consultants to that because we've done stuff like it in the past. Uh, and we've also just um, been funded along with the engineering school at Penn for a project that's called SignComp, and it's the first digital repository of video data for studying gesture and sign language. Um, and so the idea is to create an organization where people can both come and videotape gesture and, and sign language for purposes of study, but they can also come in over the web or perhaps um, uh, come in with a truck and take away data for analysis. So these two things suggest that um, large-scale audio and video over the internet is not so far away since um, we know that the technology is coming along. We've seen it from our, our uh, work with these two groups. And we also know that funding is available to study, to study these absorbing these areas. Okay. So let's move on to digital data and how we see it being built and, uh, 
and uh, we'll be seeing the issues of uh, fuzzy digital data. So this will be somewhat preaching to the choir, but let's go through it very quickly. Why digital data at all? We know that it offers another mode of presentation. Um, and we know that there are people in, the popula in our population who prefer that mode of presentation. The talk that was before this one, um, Max Young's talk, he was actually uh, complaining about the fact that there's so little emphasis right now on looking at students' learning styles and trying to do things to uh, accommodate the variety of learning styles. And one of the things that digital data is is one more uh, method of presentation beside books. We know that digital data can be dynamic, right? You can actually um, uh, develop code to present digital data and also interact with the user who's trying to view it. Obviously, it's easier and faster to access, even from a distance, and that has implications for when faculty and staff are at conferences, for example. Uh, and it has staff for distance learning programs. It's uh, easier to search. It's redundant in the sense that multiple people can, can view it simultaneously, so that gives it an advantage over a book, right? You can have, if you're thinking about your digital library project, for example, you have one book in the library, one person can see it at a time, you make that book digital, everyone can see it at the same time. Uh, it can be more easily mon monitored and profiled, and this is a touchy area for some people, but I've been in situations where, libra where libraries have uh, out loud admitted that they wished they knew what books their faculty were reading so that they could serve them better. Faculty will necessarily like that, like that idea. Um, it deflects demand from non-digital resources, so it's got, a possible, it's got a potential benefit for preservation. Um, and it otherwise helps preservation too. Now, if there are any preservation libraries in the audience, they're now getting their tomato ready. And um, I'm going to put my raincoat on and come back to why I think it helps for preservation. Uh, and in computer-aided legal instruction, and by this I mean the enterprise, not the organization. In computer-aided legal instruction in general, it offers an alternative to embedding data into code. So again, in the, in the talk that came before this one, uh, in the same room, um, one of the issues that came up was how many times um, Cali has had to sort of change offering systems because you know, new advances are out there and uh, we want to take advantage of them. So we take advantage of them by porting the software to a whole new platform. And part of the reason why that's, diff why that's hard to do and time consuming and necessary is because authoring, when you offer lessons, the one possible way of doing it is to take the data, the content, and stick it into the same file with the program. And if you do that, then when you change the platform, you get to rewrite everything. On the other hand, if your data is contiguous digital data, and you have a piece of software that knows how to reach in, pull a piece out, and show it, you can switch to a new platform, you can change to a new authoring package. As long as that authoring package also knows how to display the code, you don't get to rewrite it all, all over again. So this practice of you know cutting out a few paragraphs of a file and putting it into a, a, a lesson authoring system to show it and ask questions about it um, has its disadvantages, and one of them is that uh, whenever you switch to a new environment, you get to do that all over again. Um, there are some uses in law. Uh, some of these will be uh, familiar to you and some of them will be completely out of left field. Let's just walk through some of them. Possible uses in law of uh, digital data. So, you know, traditional ones like the admissions and placement office want structured demographic data. They want to know the names and addresses of their applicants. <laughs> Um, and the library wants to know about its patrons and about its collection. That's the sort of oldest one, I suppose. Um, and in legal research, we of course want full text of cases so we can search them and read them. Those are all traditional. And now the sort of wacky uses of it, there's of course the virtual law tour that you, you know, come see our building and walk around as though you were here kind of application that you've seen implemented in different ways on different law schools uh, with pages. Uh, or video, or talking resumes, right, for your students. Uh, I guess at Penn, this is, hasn't come out as talking resumes, but has come out as an interest in um, uh, teleconferencing so that law students can be interviewed by potential firms from a distance without having either party think to travel. Uh, video examples of interviews and negotiations. So people are doing this now, but they're doing it primarily without digital technology. Let's look at uh, a negotiation done badly Let's watch a videotape of a negotiation done badly and criticize it and learn from learn from that. Um, that can be done now with the videotape and 
potentially be done more efficiently with, uh, with digital video. Of course, data to go when your faculty goes on summer vacation and they want their data. Uh, when I was at Penn, my faculty would routinely come into the office around this time every year and tell me they were going off to some great place uh, off the coast of New England on an island that didn't have telephones and was visited once every three days by a furry and it was great and they were looking forward to the peace and quiet and oh, can I get internet while I'm there, <laughs> right? Um, or can I take my data with me? And so the answer has been yes if you, if you load it up into a truck and drive it across <laughs> on the ferry, you can get it. And other things like analysis of performances at, at, at Moot Court. And another thing I worked on at Penn, which was uh, Barbara Woodhouse's virtual Supreme Court and virtual family law class, where she did, in fact, um, tape <coughs> interviews, tape attorney-client interviews, and show little snippets of them. This was done two years ago when the bandwidth problem was even worse than it is now and when compression was even worse than it is now. But showed little clips of them and built it into a kind of web-based discussion of the issues in, in these two classes. Okay. And there are also some applications where um, legal data can be used to feed development of technology, which then uh, kind of loops back and benefits the legal profession. So for example, speech recognition systems that are optimized for legal language. So I know there was a presentation, I, 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 was, I was at a parallel session, but there was a presentation earlier today on uh, dragon naturally speaking. Uh, and I assume there was some talk about the fact that dragon is also interested in developing models specific to law. I, I know that that's true, I don't know if it was discussed earlier today. But dragon is one of the few companies that's been going out of their way to try to find legal content so that their recognition engines understand, you know, what habeas corpus is and so, you know, any sort of terminology that's not common. Um, speech synthesis systems to provide information to the visually challenged. Uh, again, it has, it's the same problem in reverse. If you have a student among, among your population who's visually challenged and you'd like to be able to take advantage of things like speech synthesis so that the student could pop up uh, a case of Lexus and have the computer read it out loud to them. The problem is that, that synthesis system doesn't understand the language of law. It doesn't do very well. And machine translation of foreign government documents for, for the GovDoc librarians in the room. Um, this is becoming interesting now. There is new funding to try and revive uh, machine translation. Machine translation that began in the 50s and fizzled because the results weren't very good. Uh, they fizzled in the 60s because the results weren't very good. And so there's new funding right now to try and revive those and see if we can do a better job of 1999 technology of doing machine translation. And message understanding, which is probably the, one of the most interesting um, message understanding projects are being funded by a number of government organizations. And the, the goal here is to take a piece of software, uh, develop a piece of software that can look at prose and pull out structured information. So classic cases, um, uh, let's see. A natural disaster strikes, there's all kinds of news reporting on it. But really all you care about is you know, where it hit, how much damage, who was hurt, how many people. The rest of the details you don't care about. So you'd like to have a piece of software that looks at the reporting on a natural disaster and comes back to you and, re and responds with very structured pieces of information. You can imagine wanting the same thing for, for law too, right? where it looks at some um, uh, well, uh, reports of a, of a case and, and response, you know, who are the uh, participants in the case and what was the decision rendered and so forth. That has to be done by humans right now. But message understanding technology offers the promise of doing it uh, automatically. Now, I said uh, a few minutes ago that I was going to talk about why I think digital data is useful for preservation, and so I'll, I'll try and do it now. So if you're a preservation librarian, get out your tomato. Um, this is a model that I've been thinking about and that actually came out of discussions with the people from the Vincent Boyce Library um, on uh, is, the, is digitization of their collection good enough uh, to help preserve the collection. So looking at this model, imagine this is time along this axis and this is the condition of the original material along this axis. And you know that a, a piece of basic material, a book, of uh, audio recording, a video recording, is going to degrade. And the degrade, degradation curve, I don't know exactly what it is. Is it linear or is it almost linear? It's going to degrade at some rate so that at some point in the future, the material is going to be at such a state that you can't use it anymore. 
All right, let's just leave it abstract and say, say that much. And maybe it's a straight line degradation, or maybe it starts slow and gets faster as the folks binding falls apart, the rest of it falls apart faster as the paper gets brittle, cracks, whatever. But there's some kind of curve of degradation uh, of original material. And it looks like something like that. And the worry among preservation librarians, at least as I understand it, is that the digital curve is like this. The, what I, in my discussions with them, I, I've heard them say out loud, what they're worried about is that they know that digital data doesn't degrade in general because it's checksum uh, support backup and so forth. But they're worried about some future time, something happens, the disk crashes or one bit gets screwed, gets screwed up, and all of a sudden it degrades immediately to a state where it's not, not usable. Um, and so, I think the only the, the approach that we worked out in these discussions was to say if you know what the, the if you if you know the digital uh, degradation curve is, or at least if you have a sense of what it is, you can set up a series of refreshes on a regular basis before the actual degradation happens. And if you do that, the curve should actually be uh, flat. There should be no degradation if you can refresh it on new medium. Um, you know, a year before it's a, the uh, old medium dies. And so I think this has promise, and it, for the folks who are in the room who are sysops, you know that the cost of this refresh gets less and less each time. Because if this is, if, let's say this for three years, that would be too short, but let's say for three years, you know that in three years, the technology that you need to store the same amount of data is, you know, one third the price and so forth. Okay. So let's talk about the types of digital data, and this will lead into a uh, discussion about how how it's created and annotated. So traditionally, you know, the sort of original type of digital data was structured data, right? Databases, relational databases of, of names and so forth, and addresses, whatever. Um, we know that law um, has focused on full text. That's the piece of digital data, the kind of digital data that's most popular in law, with, uh, I guess, the exception of that brief excursion into digital video for education purposes that happened a while back. Um, and we know that imaging is certainly gaining speed. Just look at the number of digital library projects that are out there. Um, and this laptop sitting right here has enough storage right now to hold 160,000 uncompressed page and images of book pages. So we know that the technology is now getting to the stage where um, it's time to think about imaging at least. Uh, and I, we, think that, we think that the technology for audio is also prime, is also ready. And the technology for video is a little premature yet. It's still kind of expensive to do digital video. <clears throat> so the steps in creating, I'm going to now switch to um, uh, some of our experiences in creating these corpora that, that I've been talking about. So we have these steps in creating a digital data, a corpus of digital data. Planning, acquisition of the original if you don't already have it, assessment of the project, um, actual collection, Segmentation, which I'll need to define a little later if it doesn't already, if you don't already have an intuitive sense of what it is. Annotation, which is um, you know what librarians call adding metadata, linguists call it coding, and people have different names for it. Quality assurance, preparation for distribution, and distribution. Those are the steps that we use when we create corpora. So um, when you're planning a project, you need to ask yourself what the purpose of the project is and how the data is going to be distributed. And that's actually going to affect a lot of the decisions you make downstream. You need to look at the original material and it's the content, the nature of the content, but also the physical medium that it's on. Uh, obviously, you need to assess the costs or the options of the costs for creating the digital collection. Are you going to outsource it or are you going to do it in-house? If you outsource it, it may be cheaper, but you don't learn anything about the collection during that process. And you also need to do uh, the process for digitization and figure out what the timeline is going to be. Um, during the collection process, one of the, some of the most important issues, I think, are, first of all, realizing that collection doesn't just mean digitizing paper. There are other kinds of, there are other sources of digital data out there that can be useful in this, in this community. Um, for example, there are other databases on the World Wide Web, and one of the things we do regularly is capture data from other organizations' websites. If we're trying to learn something about news in China, we find websites discussing the news in China and we start mirroring them using WGET, or we start mirroring them using Perl programs that actually you know, use 
part of the problem right now with getting data off the web is that a lot of it, you can't just go and click and read it anymore. You now have to fill out a form, and then the form, after you fill out the form and click submit, then you get the data. Well, luckily, um, uh, extremely lazy programmers have responded by developing software that fills out forms for you. Mm -hmm. So if you know the structure of a form on the web, you can actually write programs to answer it as though it were you, clicking, clicking every possible choice and getting the data back. And we, we actually use that technology a lot um, because we do a lot of collection off the web. Um, typesetters files, I, I wanted to raise this because I've been in so many meetings where uh, we've talked about wanting to digitize a new book. Um, and the, the method of choice was to scan it. And we knew that the, uh, the, you know, the people who typeset it were still alive somewhere, and we could get the typesetters files and just convert the data. So I want to make the point that when you're converting from book, it's important to remember that that's an option, uh, or at least it may be an option worth discussing. It's, often, it's much cheaper to convert a typeset version of a book than it's a scan from paper. We found that anyway. Um, there are a couple more issues that come up when you're thinking about resolution. And the point I want to make here is that these issues are sort of the same across all mediums, right? So the issues of resolution and quantization are the same whether you're talking about paper, audio, video, uh, or even just uh, text files off the web. So resolution refers to, to the degree to which an analog signal has to be sampled to make a digital signal. What's that mean? In paper, it means you've got a sheet of paper that you want to digitize. And the way you digitize it is essentially to lay a grid over it, right, um, with lots of rows and columns. And then the, salt, the computer looks at each grid and decides whether that grid is white or black or gray or red and stores that information. That's what, um, that's what digitization is for paper. And the resolution question is how big is the grid? How many rows and columns are there? The more rows and columns you've got, uh, the higher the quality of the data is, the more space it takes up. So. Um, in the graphic world, we know that the resolution, current practice in, in resolution is to do something between two and 600 dots per inch. Uh, in audio, uh, digitizing audio, there's a sort of wide range too, and it's based upon two uh, uh, assumptions that I'll get back to later on. And the assumptions are, um, is it more important to think in terms of uh, what the human system can perceive, or is it more important to think in terms of how much data is encoded, how much information is encoded in the data? And that's one of the reasons why there are so many uh, sampling rates for audio data right now. Um, quantization refers to a, a, a similar problem. The question there, go back to the, uh, uh, the grid for, for digitizing paper, right? Quantization refers to how many values are possible within any one of those cells on my grid. So as I'm looking at a, uh, a page from a book, for example, um, and I, it's, let's say it's color, how many colors can I represent if I want to digitize a piece of the book of Kells? Uh, that's the quantization problem. And it's the same problem again whether you're talking about text or audio or video. Okay? So again, when you're trying to digitize a uh, sound file, so, but you also have to ask the question, how many values can I store? And the more values you pick, the higher the quality is, and also the bigger the files are. So these are the issues that you've got to deal with when you're doing collection. Uh, again, the current practice for um, images is to use, well, let's start with text. Current practice for text is, is ranges between one and two bytes. If, if it's just English you're encoding, you encode one byte per character. If you're trying to do multilingual data, you have to encode two bytes per character because that allows you to encode all the world's languages. So uh, depending upon which kind of uh, data you're trying to deal with, you need to, if it's multilingual data, double your expectations about how big the corpus is going to be. And of course, uh, as many of you know, in graphic uh, data, the issues are, do I do it by tonal? Is it just black and white? Am I doing grayscale? Am I using color? Another point I want to make is that uh, the technology in this area is developing rapidly so that if you start your planning process and it takes six months to get funded, you better come back to your planning process again, look at it again, because the technology won't change in six months. So whatever you could have done expensively earlier is, now, is probably not cheap. I want to talk about, collect, uh, come back to this issue of quantization and, um, and resolution by giving you another model to think about. 
So you're trying to decide at what rate you're going to digitize something. This could be text, it could be audio, it could be video, it could be images. What are the issues you've got to think about? You've got to decide upon, use to decide upon uh, the resolution and therefore the cost of the project. So again, for this model, imagine that time is running across the bottom of the screen and um, quality is running across the, is running off the side, right? So one possible thing to think about is the limit of the biological system. Humans, typically, but I say biological system because if I'm in a room full of linguists and say humans, they'll always say, well, what about animal language and so forth? <laughs> um, what, so for one of the questions is, what can humans perceive? And that's one of the things you've got to think about when you're about to do a digitization project. For example, um, in audio, you can now digitize up to um, 44,000 cycles per second. That is, you can sample the audio file 44,000 times per second. Can a human perceive that? Do I need to go higher than that? Why don't I digitize 100,000 cycles per second? Well, the answer is, above 44,000 cycles per second, humans can't tell. They can't tell the difference. So you're wasting time and effort to digitize above the threshold, you know, the sort of the ability of the biological system, the ability of humans. Another uh, parameter to use is this principle of full information capture that uh, if any of you have been to the Cornell uh, Library of Congress sponsored um, workshops on uh, uh, digital imaging for, for libraries, they promote this idea of full information capture, which is to say, look at the source material and ask yourself, what's the smallest detail in the source material that I want to capture? And then set your threshold appropriately to handle that. So again, they're thinking primarily about scanning books. If I'm going to scan some books, put, go by a jeweler's loop, stick it in your eye, look at the book, find the smallest detail that you care about, measure the size of that detail, and there's a big table you can look up that will tell you how to digitize. If you care about the serifs on the letters, then you have to digitize at a higher resolution. If you care about the browning around the outside of the pages, then you have to use a higher color depth. So the principle of full information capture, you can imagine people uh, wanting to capture less information than humans can perceive because it's not there in the book. See what I'm saying? Um, humans might be able to see down to a certain uh, uh, point size, but if the book doesn't contain that point size, we don't need to digitize that level. A third principle is this principle of just let's worry about current needs. And so, of course, your current needs could be much less than, uh, than either of the other two principles. For example, if I'm only faxing data, uh, currently data that's being faxed is at 200 by 300 dots per inch. Uh, that's the current fax standard. And that's, of course, much lower than either the principle of full information capture or what humans can see. Okay. Another uh, component to this is what does the technology allow you to do? So starting off at time, now all these things are kind of the same across time, right? But this one changes. The technology, you know, if you go back far enough, didn't allow you to do anything. And uh, grow, and technology improves at a certain rate until it gets to a, a stage where it can do things you don't necessarily need to do. And so the question is, how do I set the appropriate uh, resol resolution uh, or capture quality? And the other principle is to say, just what can the technology do? And that's what I'll do. And that's obviously a sensible thing to say when the, this, this line crosses the line that you care about, but it's not, it's not necessarily a sensible thing to say in this era. And unfortunately, this is the era where we are in video right now, somewhere around here. Another possibility is to ask yourself what your funding will allow you to do, right? Because the technology is one thing, but can you actually pay for it? So you can imagine if you're well-funded, your funding would sort of track what the technology could do, and if you're poorly funded, you might you know, not be able to afford what's available right now. And um, of course, the you know, holy grail, the happy state, is when your funding crosses the line where uh, that's all humans can see. And you're actually here for most things now. Uh, we've sort of reached that, that state on the curve for text and graphics and audio, but not for video, unfortunately. So, What's, what's that mean? What that means is pretty much anybody on the planet can now afford a, a video capture, uh, sorry, an audio, uh, audio capture board, which can capture audio data at quality that's so good that no human can perceive anything beyond it, right? 
What does that mean? You know, sound blasters for $169 can capture up to 22,000 cycles per second, which is the maximum rate that any human can perceive. You don't need more than that. So that's one of the reasons why we think that audio is now to the stage where it makes sense to talk about audio corporately. Let's move on to the segmentation part of this. So we view segmentation as either actually or virtually chopping data up, a glob of data up into pieces. If you're in structured data, it would be records or fields. If you were digitizing a book, you'd be chopping it up into chapters and sections and so forth. Um, the granularity that you use depends upon what you, what you need, obviously. And I just wanted to make the point that a, what we call a standoff approach is more appropriate uh, for a lot, of, a lot of projects than actually chopping it up. What does, it, what does that mean? I, um, this graph came from a discussion I had last night with um, um, Larry, Larry Farmer. So he's talking about a collection right now where he's taped interviews, uh, attorney-client interviews, and he's using them to show good and bad ways to interview your clients in preparation for a, a legal action. So he's got the original audio right here, and what he wants to be able to do is annotate it into, you know, when's the attorney talking, when's the client talking, when did the attorney do something good, and when did the attorney do something bad. And so you can imagine wanting to chop it up in different ways, depending upon what it is you're trying to mark. But if you actually chop it up, if you actually cut the file into pieces, you're going to have problems when you no longer want to talk about who, know who's talking, but you now want to talk about the good section versus the bad section, because those segmentations won't necessarily align. So uh, the approach that's used uh, in a lot of the work that we do is we actually leave the audio file whole, and there's a separate file where we've said where the, you know, it's an editing file that we use for video, where the good stop and start points are. Um, annotation is the process that we use to add value to raw data. Um, and again, if you're talking about uh, structured data, it's things like date and authority fields. If you're cataloging, then it's the, it's the uh, control vocabulary that you use to catalog a book. Um, and if you're transcribing speech or identifying participants or highlighting the important points of a, of a story, that's also what we consider annotating. So it's a general term uh, that means any, anything that humans add to a collection of audio or video or text data to improve the quality of it. When we do um, corpus collections, one of the big issues is um, quality assurance. Uh, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, let's first define some terms, and I'll give you some examples from a, ca uh, a cataloging effort. So there's four kinds of uh, quality assurance that we are routinely asked to do by sponsors. Uh, the one is called precision quality assurance, which says um, every time I categorize something a certain way, I, I want to go back and look at it and make sure I didn't do that mistakenly. For example, if you're um, uh, if you're doing cataloging, if you're actually a librarian doing cataloging, you can imagine um, applying a set of catalog terms to to a bunch of books for a given week, and then going back at the end of the week and saying, "Show me all the books that I put in this category now, all together. Let me look at them all and make sure that I still agree that they all belong in the same category." So we routinely do that for for corpus building. Whatever the corpus is that we're building, there's a process like that that says. Whenever I've uh, made an annotation about a piece of data, bring them all together and look at them all at once and make sure I still agree with that annotation. Uh, recall is kind of the reverse of it. It's make sure I didn't miss, fail to annotate something in a certain way. So, you know, did I, uh, did I fail to find the book that's in the same category as the other ones I've cataloged? And we routinely do this by using other, like two or three kinds of technology to do the same thing. So, um, to take the example of categorizing stories about what topic they discuss. Um, we start off by having the humans read the story and categorize it. Uh, then we have a search engine search a whole bunch of stories that it thinks are related to a certain topic, and the humans go back and check. So we're uh, using human judgment plus computer judgment to see if they converge. Uh, and that, that helps us find mistakes that humans naturally make. If you were doing, if you were an annotator at Lexis, for example, you're categorizing stories from Lexis to say which ones are about, you know, a certain Supreme Court decision, um, you, you would want to follow up by not just having the humans read them and make the judgments, but also by sort of running a search engine, a, a third search engine. Look at what it returns back to you as possible hits and say, did, I, did the search engine find things that my humans missed? That's what we call this. 
discrepancy is um, when two annotators disagree, that has to be resolved, right? You can't leave those discrepancies in the system. Uh, and finally, we're all usually asked to measure what we call inter-annotator agreement is. This is sort of related to quality assurance, but the question is how hard is the task? And again, you can imagine this being a big issue in cataloging, book cataloging. How hard is it to catalog? You can estimate how hard that is by asking two different people to catalog the same set of books completely independently, then compare the results, and then look at the number of times they agree and disagree. That's the measure of how hard the task is. If the disagreement is, is significant, don't yell at them when they, do, when they don't get it right because it's a difficult problem for humans. Uh, if the agreement is in general good, then you know um, that you should expect consistent results from your annotators. What are the percentages you sorry? What are the percentages referred to here? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the percentage, <laughs> when we do a corpus collection, the percentage of the material that we subject to this kind of test. So uh, the precision test across 100%, all material is checked to make sure that annotations are applied correctly. Um, when we do recall, we'll like, Let's say we're doing categorization of stories again, right? So we're trying to find all the stories that discuss um, the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. Um, we'll actually issue some search terms Clinton Lewinsky trip, star, blah, blah, blah. Uh, look at all the hits, that, and the, all the hits will come back from the search engine. We'll look at tw the 20, top 20% 20 of those to make sure that we didn't miss anything that the search engine's found. Um, for discrepancy, every single discrepancy that exists has to get checked. And we we sort of we have a process that, is, that um, inserts discrepancy into the corpus. Um, the way we do it is down here, whenever we're building a corpus, we actually, uh, without telling the annotators that we're doing this, have about 5 to 10% of the documents annotated twice by two people who, independently, um, and, and then look for discrepancies that way. And that's also how we measure their, their agreement. Finally, there's uh, distribution issues that I'm going to go over quickly because I don't want to need a little time for questions. Um, uh, the one I want to focus on is, of course, intellectual property and confidentiality. Uh, if you're collecting data, you're going to be distributing over the web. One thing you need to be, you know, be careful about is who owns the intellectual property for this data? Do you have rights to distribute it? Were any humans involved in the, let's say, were interviews of uh, uh, attorneys interviewing their clients and you want to show videotapes of that? Do you have permission forms for both parties to? distribute this information over the web and so forth. Um, well, I'll, let me step back for a second. Um, another, so there are a few more issues like, um, if you're going to distribute stuff over the World Wide Web, you've got to worry about, uh, you, you get sort of great distribution because lots of people have web access, but you have a big bandwidth problem that you wouldn't have if you're distributing locally. Um, at the LDC, we actually have a model to deal with this. And the way the model works is, you know, our corporate are enormous. I think I mentioned before, it was something like 450 gigabytes of, of data. And of course, if you wanted to download that over the web, it would take something like four months. Um, so the way we solve that problem is we allow people to come in and query the corporate on our own system. You come in and you type in a search term, and you get the results first. But the results are chopped up into little pieces. That's why segmentation matters for us. Right? All the data is chopped up into little tiny pieces. And so let's say you're searching for articles that discuss the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. You issue that search term. The results come back. You look at the stories you want. You can read them if, if they're in text form. If you want to hear them, you can actually select little pieces of it. And it's the little pieces that get distributed to you over the web, not the whole file. So it's this mixture, a combination of having large data, but being able to query it in small pieces that we've adopted to try and solve the, the fact that our bandwidth currently, our data is currently too much to fit through the web, web bandwidth that exists right now. Just a little, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I'm going to conclude by pointing out that uh, we're covering again the fact that digital data is more than just text and images. I want to again say that the corporate in law, not just the kind that we've created, but the kind that some of you are probably creating also, um, has a, a number of purposes. One is it supports your own mission, but the other one is that it also feeds, it also helps train technology to become sensitive to the language of law, which then benefits uh, you all, right? I mean, if information systems get better at dealing with law, that'll be better for you all. Uh, I'm big on that point because I actually spent, uh, two years ago we had a workshop at Penn about the fact that current information material technology is so poor for dealing with statutory material, right? Because the model that it uses is based upon words that occur 
um, commonly in the text that I want, but not commonly everywhere else. And the problem with statutory material is the vocabulary is so diverse that that approach fails, actually. And the other, the other difference is that information retrieval systems typically um, don't have to find you the best document. They have to find you a lot of documents. So if you do a web search, you've seen this a million times now, um, you do a web search and you get back several thousands of documents and the first 10 are no good for you, but if you go down a while, you find four or five that are pretty good. Unfortunately, when you're searching statutory material, what you want is the one single piece of statute that answers your question, right? And parent systems can't do that. Okay, um, I want to also make the point that I think standards and infrastructures are ready to support widespread digital data, although video is still kind of expensive. Uh, and there's also still the need for end user tools for developing this, these corpora uh, and, and for delivering them. So I, I think that we're at a stage where um, we can talk about digital um, collections, but before you dive in, you have to be careful to make sure that there are existing tools out there to do the kind of markup and also the kind of delivery that you want to do. Okay, I should probably close there. Just a few minutes of questions. Yeah. You have, uh, you have some data that you want to digitize in this way if you're a, an organization. I mean, in order to make the proposal to you, which it sounds like you do, you would, the, the cost of it would depend on what, what, what the data, data is digitized already. What you want to do with it, and how it's already structured, and so on. Is that is that how you determine cost? I, I'm assuming you do some sort of proposal back and forth, and then, right? You know, as if you're not about to get the money. But how does that kind of work here? Um, I mean, I raise that because at least I guess I should step back a bit and be clear about it. Uh, a lot of the digitization work that we do is. Uh, expensive in terms of equipment and staff needed, but you can all think of, I mean, you all know about other efforts in uh, corporate building that are not so expensive. I think many people in this room are probably in one or another corporate building effort right now that they're handling just fine with their own resources. So, you know, my points were meant to say, not, not just to say all corporate collecting is very expensive and has to be done very careful, but, but to get to your main question, um, yeah, we typically, uh, do an analysis of, of the collection based upon the original materials, what needs to be done with them, and therefore what resolution they need to be captured in, how they're going to be distributed. Um, so, so, the the so, for example, if you're doing a digital library project and you want to scan a bunch of books and you want to have control over searching right down to the section level, then yeah, you've got to segment not just not just by chapters, but also by the sort of smallest unit that you care about seeing as a return. So segmentation plays a big factor. And you know, we've done corpora, uh, let's see, in the simplest cases, like in the UN parallel text corpus, a file is, a, is an atom, and we don't do anything more with a file, you know, just, Whole, a whole unit, you can read it or you can search it or whatever, but we don't chop it any smaller than that. Uh, there's another corpus that we did, one of the early ones, to support um, speech recognition. And the idea was to make it possible for systems to hear every possible sound of English in combination with every other possible sound of English. So the way that one was collected was we had uh, hundreds of people across the U.S. in different regions reading sentences that had all the possible combinations of sounds in English, and then chopped it down to the sound level. So you could hear the P if you wanted separately. Right, so depending upon what your need is, the segmentation granularity is going to be widely variable and that affects, that affects the cost. Uh, but uh, you, also, uh, you also raised this question, I think, about how do we begin a dialogue about collection? And one of the things I'm very interested in doing is, is talking to people who have a possible um, collection need just to talk about it. I mean, it's... We're nonprofits, so we're happy to consult on things that don't actually benefit us, don't actually generate revenue for us because we don't think about revenue anyway. So if you've got a collection and you want to talk about it some more, we might be happy to talk to you about it. I'm sorry. I'm only thinking about you all over all this reusability in mind. Mm -hmm. like, for example, you mentioned the UN Open Text Corpus. Um, parts of that corpus would be all the parts of the corpus, say, of 
US documents or international organization documents. So it could be subsets, it could be interlinking parts. To what degree would it be possible to continue building on your existing work? That's a, um, an important point for uh, oh, an important feature for us. For lack of time, I didn't go into all the standards that exist for text versus audio versus video, but um, one of the ways we try and encourage reusability is by using the current standards um, and by continually, like we actually are involved in some of the standard setting processes. We've, uh, we're uh, regular colleagues with the National Institute of Standards and Technology who have developed the SPHERE format for audio data and the, what's called the UTF format for text data, and we have input into that into those standards, and, uh, but are also very aware of them and what it takes to convert from one to another. So I think that having standards for creating digital data in the first place is probably the most important step to reusability. There are others like, um, can we annotate this data in a way that's sensible and will make sense for future purposes? That's a bit of a harder problem to solve because you, know, you can imagine for one project wanting sort of uh, minute detail and for another project wanting just a few things annotated, depending upon which one you begin first, you don't get too much reusability out of the annotation. You, you have to do it over again for the second project. Being aware of it probably helps. Being aware of it helps. I don't, there's, I don't think there exists a solution for that, you know, the problem of what you want to annotate and, and, and when, but it, you can at least solve the formatting problem, I and mean, the formatting problem just shouldn't exist, right? You should. You do you allow reuse of the documents in other contexts? Do we? Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, uh, again, a nonprofit charitable organization, and um, when organizations buy our data, they buy it. When they, when they are, join our, our consortium, they can reuse our data. If you wanted to take yours and put it on the web, it's fine with me. Do you mind saying how much buying involves? I mean, what are the figures? For example, yearly membership in the Linguistic Data Consortium is $2,000. Yearly, yearly membership, and um, we typically publish about a dozen to 20 corporate per year. Um, and if you're a member, you can have all of those corporate in the year. Um, if for, for law, at the current moment, that wouldn't be the best solution because we publish about one a year that's, that's interesting to law. So what I'm hoping to get out of this discussion is not, you know, people flocking to join the LDC because you won't want most of what we produce but a kind of discussion about, we're, we're collecting legal corporate anyway to support people like Dragon and, and IBM who want to do research and information retrieval and speech technology. Now what I want to see if I can do is do it better so that it also benefits universities, um, libraries, researchers, and so forth. Other questions? Hi, Dr. Chris, we've talked to Lots of conversations in the past about the law is legal data is sort of linguistically interesting. Mm -hmm. And like this morning's uh, plenary session, uh, the speaker was talking about uh, dog law and, and right. sales of chattels mm -hmm. and describing the difficulty of trying to get from one to the other when going like electronic research. They have to search for dog law. You can't really, you know, if, unless you already know this falls bad sales and channels, you wouldn't get there by doing an electronic search. So I was just wondering if, if you guys are doing anything, you know, any kind of investigative work in trying to draw those connections, um, either through the artificial intelligence or for whatever means, methods of care. Um, we are, for sure. Um, or I should say we're supporting it. The, the biggest project we're doing this year is a project called Topic Detection and Tracking. I think it was on one of my slides. And so the goal is to develop systems that monitor the media. And um, the media comes in right uh, as video, as audio, as newswire, as web pages. And so it's just kind of streaming in. And so the software is supposed to actually do the segmentation for you. So it knows the structure of news stories. And it, so it knows when it sees things like, next up, we're going to talk about the Lewinsky scandal, that that's a story boundary and it chops there. Yeah, virtual chops, actually. And the next thing it does is it actually um, categorizes those stories automatically as to what topic they discuss. You can just you can imagine transferring this to law immediately, right? It, it, you know, it could know the difference if it had the right material. If it weren't news, but instead um, uh, statutory material, it could also be trained to chop that material into statutes about different kinds of things. Um, so it categorizes it into topics, and then 
if you identify a topic that you're interested in, it will go and hunt up all the other stories that discuss that topic. That technology is completely generalizable. It's com all it's based upon is statistical measures of word frequency and word coherence. So the way they do this stuff is it's amazingly simple, um, but they kind of count the number of words that say uh, dog, chattel and you know uh, mangy dog and other stories by and computer told me and so forth. But all it really does is it um, builds a model of what are all the say three or four or five word combinations that exist in this data. Then let's sort them statistically and we'll find, for example, that some three or four or five word combinations are really common in stories about dog bites and are not very common in stories about the uh, you know, um, age of consent. Uh, so there could be stories that could be statutes. And that's all, because it's all statistical and all kind of um, abstracted from the actual content, it can be generalized. If, for example, uh, let's imagine that the, the sponsoring agencies like NSF really got interested in uh, categorizing statutory material, you, you could imagine us hunting down the statutes of all the states, um, collecting it up into a project just like this, and the same technology would work. I mean, it really is. We've, we've seen this happen because this year we went from, uh, from English to Mandarin, right? So it's even across different languages, and they're using, in fact, the same technology. They're just giving it different training data now. Now they're giving it Mandarin stories instead of English stories that they were giving it last year. And the technology is moving right along and handling the Mandarin data too. So um, I think the promise for for that kind of solving that kind of problem is is very good. Uh, and again, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. I'd like to see um, collaboration in identifying what kinds of things that the community needs from technology, finding what kind of data would be useful to support that bringing in some of the organizations who do that research and trying to get them interested in doing it. Um, I think we have those three pieces together. We have very interesting work going on. Other questions? I didn't um, just go back and point out the address for the website for the LDC is www.ldc, where pen, so stuff you pen that edu. Um, you can read about these projects <coughs> if you're interested. And there's also um, a demonstration version of our system called LDC Online. Uh, and unfortunately, all of what's in it right now is, is primarily for language engineers. These three corpora are not in it, although I guess we should try to do, we should try to do that. But if you wanted to see uh, an example of this distribution model I mentioned, where you do queries, and the queries get executed on the server, and the server presents you back with a kind of list of very small pieces of the information you might want, and then you hear them or read them. Um, you can actually do it for, you know, it's just freely available. There are pieces, some of our are freely available to the public. You can uh, log on there and do a couple searches and listen to pieces of news stories or listen to telephone calls between French people and stuff like this. Uh, several examples up there that you can uh, query that way. I, I realize it'd be more interesting if we actually had one of these corporate up there. That may, be what, that may be the next move to try and stimulate this discussion is for us to put a piece of one of these little corporate up on LDC online and promote at least, you know, playing with it among this group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.